Good day to you all, wherever you are. I hope you're well and surviving this extended lockdown here in the UK. I expect, like me, you're all looking forward to the vaccination. For those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the Society, but now as chair of the events committee, I try to keep all our events and activities going and are always looking for new ideas, new interests and uh, forward looking talks. So please get in touch with me if you've got some. Anyway, welcome to this, the British Interplanetary Society's 13th live streamed evening lecture since the first lockdown began. As I said last time, we've got a lot planned for the year. Our big Beyond the Moon Symposium on 12th April, Cosmonauts Day, will be a virtual conference, but we're hoping to run our Reinventing Space Conference on the 28th to 30th of June as a full-blown conference in the QE2 Conference Centre in Westminster. The call for papers for both events is out and details are on our bis.com website. I'll tell you more about them at the end and our future lecture, lecture programme if I have time. Today we are again using Crowdcast system for both the presentation and the Q&A. It worked well last time, so let's hope we have a trouble-free session tonight. You will have seen this time that there is a donate button at the bottom right-hand side of this page. If you've enjoyed this evening and want to make a small donation, every little helps to cover the cost of our evening lectures. Please use the question system to ask your questions anytime during the talk. As most of you know, if you've actually got the chance, you can actually vote the questions that you want asked first by pushing the vote button, and that will move them up the pecking order. Anyway, I'm pleased to say that we have our resident Apollo expert and space educator, Jerry Stone, with us tonight to tell us all about the Apollo 14 mission to the moon back in January, February, 1971. Yes, it's 50 years ago. How many of us can remember back that far? I won't say any more, as I know Jerry will introduce himself and his subject in much more detail. Over to you, Jerry. Really, for those who don't know me, I am Jerry Stone. I'm a freelance space presenter. There I am. And I'm on Space Flight UK. I've been giving talks about space exploration for over 50 years, having started when I was at school back in 1969. Um, now I run Spaceflight UK. I, well, I pre-COVID went out to schools all over the country doing space workshops. And I'm hoping we can get back to doing that before the um, European ExoMars rover, Rosalind Franklin, arrives on Mars in two years time because I have a new workshop in which pupils will be able to mimic the rovers search for life on Mars by doing experiments in the classroom. So there we go. I'm also an author. This is uh, one of my books, One Small Step, about uh, getting to the moon. Um, and this is my latest find out space travel suitable for eight-year-olds of all ages so if you're looking for something uh, either for yourself or for a youngster um, then do contact me do not please please do not buy these on Amazon because I don't get a penny <laughs> um, send me an email and you'll have the other advantage that uh, if it comes from me, I will sign it for you. So I've been giving a series of talks marking the 50th anniversary of each of the Apollo flights started in uh, October 2018. I'll be carrying through to the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17 in December 2022. And we've now reached Apollo 14. Um, 
when putting this together, I was wondering where to start. And I realized that I actually had to start back with the Mercury astronauts because the commander of Apollo 14 was Alan Shepard, who you can see there, one of the original seven Mercury astronauts. And as it turned out, the only one of them ever to go to the moon. He was America's first man in space. 60 years ago this year, on May the 5th, 1961, he flew on Mercury Redstone 3, uh, a suborbital flight because the Atlas rocket, which would put Mercury into orbit, wasn't actually ready at that time. And the Redstone wasn't powerful enough to do the job. So he just went up and down, reached about 115 miles uh, above the Earth's surface. And there were, um, after Gus Grissom's suborbital flight, he was followed by four orbital Mercury missions. Shepard was actually due to fly this spacecraft, which would have been the MA-10 mission and spend three days in orbit. But this was cancelled to allow more effort to be put into Project Gemini. So Shepard was then designated as the commander of the first crewed Gemini mission with Tom Stafford as his pilot. But in 1963, he was grounded due to a condition called Meniere's disease, which affected the inner air and caused episodes of extreme dizziness. So Gus Grissom and John Young flew Gemini 3 instead. In November 1963, Shepard was designated Chief of the Astronaut Office, succeeding Deke Slayton, and he became responsible for NASA astronaut training. Five years later, Tom Stafford went to Shepard's office and told him that there was uh, a specialist surgeon in Los Angeles who developed a cure for many years disease. So this involved surgery, which was conducted in early 1969 in Los Angeles, where Shepard checked in under a pseudonym of Victor Poulos. The surgery was successful and Shepard was restored to full flight status on May the 7th, 1969, and was then set to command the next available moon mission, which would have been Apollo 13, in 1970. A rookie, Stuart Rooser, seen in the middle here, was designated the command module pilot. And Shepard asked for Jim McDivitt, who had commanded Apollo 9, as his lunar module pilot. But McDivitt said no, saying Shepard did not have sufficient Apollo training to command a moon mission. So another rookie, Ed Mitchell, was de designated the lunar module pilot instead. Slayton then submitted this proposed crew to NASA headquarters and George Muller turned them down on the grounds that the crew was too expensive. So out of the three astronauts here, only one of them had flown in space before for 15 minutes and 22 seconds, whereas on Apollo um, 11, all the astronauts had flown twice. Um, and uh, Jim Lovell um, had already flown at three times, with one reason that um, he was considered for a lunar mission. So what happened then was Deke Slayton asked Jim Lovell, who was the backup commander for Apollo 11 and was due to command Apollo 14, if his crew would be willing to fly Apollo 13 instead. NASA didn't want a delay with the mission. They wanted Apollo 13 to fly and if Shepard's crew couldn't do it, if essentially they'd bring one in that could. And Lovell said yes. So Shepard's crew was assigned to Apollo 14 
and Apollo 13 went off to the moon in April 1970. Well, as you know, they didn't have uh, things going entirely right either, because uh, Ken Mattingly, shown in the middle there, the command module pilot, was uh, found to be um, exposed to the possibility of getting measles. And if that developed during the flight, that could be a major problem. So two days before launch, his place was taken by his backup, Jack Swigert. As it turned out, Mattingly did manage to fly to the moon on Apollo 16. So off went Apollo 13 to the moon to land in the scientifically important region called Fra Mauro. But they didn't get there. This is the damaged service module as seen by the crew after they jettisoned it, after their hair raising trip around the moon and back after a tank failure inside the service module. And I use those words deliberately. There was no explosion on Apollo 13. All right, this would cue the QI klaxons. Um, the tank did not explode, it failed along its seam. So uh, it didn't fly to pieces. But having lost the opportunity to land at Fra Mauro, Apollo 14 was redesignated there instead. And this is a general view of the area. So although the crew of Apollo 14 may have had the least flight experience of any NASA mission, they did train together for 19 months after their assignment, which was the longest training time of any crew up to that point. Here they are leaving the uh, mission operations uh, uh, building to go to the Astro van to go out to the launch pad. And something that was pointed out was it rather looks as though Kirk Douglas is in the uh, the group watching them go out, but uh, I don't think that's really him. The launch took place uh, just after four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and this is the, the 31st of January, which is why it's all already dark. The launch itself was uh, pretty much OK. Um, getting into Earth orbit was OK. Everything checked out. And then the third stage engine fired again to send them off on their translunar injection. And that's when they started to have some problems. And about three hours after launch, the service and command modules were pulled free of the adapter panels surrounding the lunar module, which are shown here in this RCS impression. Uh, having hinged back, exposing the lunar module. And the idea is that the command module pilot, Stu Rusa, would then um, turn the command and service modules round. This, oops, sorry, this is called transposition and docking. So we've moved forward, first of all, turn around 180 degrees and aim the probe of the command module into the drogue of the lunar module so that the two craft could dock together. They would then release the lunar module from the S4B and fire thrusters to bring the two craft back out and they would stay in that configuration en route to the moon. So this is uh, the docking apparatus. Um, and if you think that looks a bit complicated, well, if we concentrate on that, there we go. I mean, look at this. Um, and it worked perfectly on every mission up till now. However, always uh, being a competitive pilot, Stu Rusa wanted to set a record for the lowest amount of propellant used during 
the transposition and docking. So he backed away, stopped, turned around, closed in, and here he is a view of a camera looking out one of the command module windows towards the target that Stu is looking at as they move in to dock. And there we go. So what should happen is a soft dock, an indication that the craft are touching, and then the capture latches lock in place, and you get what's called a hard dock. But that didn't happen. They made contact, but no hard dock. So they pulled back out again and tried again. And again, and again, it took six attempts over the next two hours before a hard dot was achieved. Needless to say, Stu didn't get his record. But they did capture the lunar module, and this is a view of the lunar module with Ed Mitchell and Alan Shepard inside after it had separated in orbit around the moon. Now, there'd been uh, a change here from previous flights that normally the two craft would enter an orbit roughly 60 miles above the surface of the moon. And after they separated, the descent stage engine of the lunar module would fire to slow the craft down and put it into a new orbit, which would take it lower to the surface where they would begin a powered descent. So they'd be firing the engine continuously to slow them down all the way down to the surface. Because of extra equipment that the lunar module carried on this mission, and because of uh, the fact that they would be going over a rather trickier um, surface and they wanted to allow more hovering time, the service module's engine, the descent propulsion, uh, sorry, the yeah, service propulsion engine was fired again to take the combined craft together into an orbit which had a low point of just nine miles above the lunar surface. So this would give the lunar module a lot more uh, fuel to use on its descent. However, the lunar module computer started getting an abort signal from a faulty switch. And NASA thought the computer might be getting spurious readings if a tiny ball of solder had shaken loose and was floating between the switch and the contact, closing the circuit. Well, they came up with the standard NASA solution, which is that you hit it. Um, what the crew did was tap on the panel next to the switch. And it did work briefly, but the circuit soon closed again. And if this occurred after the descent engine had fired, the computer would think the signal was real and could initiate an auto abort. That would cause the descent stage to stop firing. It would separate the ascent stage and fire the engine for it to climb back into orbit. So NASA and the software teams at MIT worked to find a solution. Uh, the software was hardwired, so it wasn't something that you could um, retype into the computer and uh, they came up with uh, a solution which was transmitted up which made it appear to the system that an abort had already taken place so any further abort signals would be ignored 
So this wouldn't stop the astronauts piloting the ship, but if they did have to initiate a genuine abort, they'd have to do that manually. So this involved a fair degree of risk. So here's the command module, um, which was called Kitty Hawk. And if we start the video, this is just after separation. And now that this is just going over the landing site on the revolution prior to actually landing. All right, let's restart that. And this is the, the filmed view out of the window of the lunar module as they come down. Now, in the middle there is Cone Crater, which was a major target for one of the EVAs. And although you can see there how it seems to be raised clear of the surrounding area, um, from ground level, it looked very different. A second problem arose during the landing when the landing radar wouldn't lock onto the surface and several attempts were made to try and fix this without the landing radar the mission rules said you do not even make an attempt and eventually uh, pretty much in the nick of time they managed to get it working again in an interview after the flight, Alan Shepard was asked whether he would have broken the rules and actually continued on and landing. And he just looked the interviewer straight in the eye and gave him the answer, which was, you'll never know. <laughs> there you can see there's uh, dust being kicked up by the descent engine as Antares, the Apollo 14 lunar module, settles gently on the surface. There's the shadow of landing leg and they're down. So here's Alan Shepard um, sporting another innovation when Armstrong and Aldrin were on the, the lunar surface and uh, 600 million people were watching live from Earth, I was one of them, in the Aldrin home, um, Buzz's son, Andy, uh, turned to one of the family and said, how can you tell which one is Mr. Armstrong? Um, because they were both wearing pretty much identical suits. Well, if the resolution on the TV had been good enough, the answer would have been Armstrong's the one with the camera. Um, but the simple expedient of adding red stripes to the commander's suit wasn't ready in time for Apollo 12. It would have been done on Apollo 13, but they didn't make it. So this is the first time we saw a red striped astronaut on the moon. Alan Shepard uh, finally got there after years and years of, of waiting. Uh, and uh, his words were, it's been a long way, but we're here. On Apollo 11 and 12, the astronauts had carried the equipment from its stowage point in the lunar module out to where it was going to be set up on the moon. This is the ALSEP, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. 
on Apollo 14, they had yet another innovation. As you can see there and there, this device has two wheels. This is a hand cart. But of course, in NASA speak, it's not a hand cart. It's an MET, a modular equipment transporter. Basically, the, uh, the astronaut comes around here and grabs the handle and can wheel the craft across the moon. Um, in fact, it proved to be um, rather difficult to use. And in some cases, the astronauts actually picked the whole thing up and uh, to, to move it around. Something that you can see here is uh, this is a, a rod which um, uh, Shepard is holding, but Mitchell put to uh, a different use later on. I'll tell you about that. So this had a number of experiments on it. There's a passive seismic um, experiment, basically a seismometer um, for measuring moonquakes. There's also an active seismometer, um, and I'll come back to that in a second, um, an, an ion detector, and uh, an ion gauge for measuring density and energy of ions in the lunar environment, so charged particles around the moon. Um, a, another one for measuring energy of solar protons and electrons reaching the moon, a magnetometer for measuring variations in the lunar magnetic field, and a laser beam reflector similar to the one left by Apollo 11 for long-term measurements of the distance from the Earth to the Moon. Um, and it's from these uh, laser reflectors that we've learned, because we've been doing this for over 50 years now, that the Moon is actually moving slowly away from the Earth. And the reason for this is because the Moon raises tides on the Earth and essentially the, the, the movement of those water over the Earth's crust causes the Earth to slow down. Uh, a major culprit for this is the Irish Sea being um, a, a large shallow area. The result of the Earth's rotation slowing is that the Moon moves further away at the rate of 3.8 centimetres per year, which by coincidence is about the rate that your fingernails grow. So you might try betting with someone that you have something directly in common with the moon. This is the hub uh, of the Allsep station. This provides the power, as you can see, from the ribbon cables that snake out from the bottom that go out to the instruments, either to provide direct power for them um, or to, uh, to get data back, which will be transmitted back to Earth. Here's Ed Mitchell uh, with uh, a map exploring the surface. So having set up all the all-set experiments on day one, the objective of day two on the moon was to reach Cone Crater. And this is it as seen from orbit. Unfortunately, the astronauts couldn't find it. The maps that they had, which showed views like this, seemed to imply a, a fairly well-defined edge to the, the crater. And they also thought that they would be able to use rocks, boulders, such as ones here, 
and there, um, that they'd be, be able to identify at ground level. Whereas, in fact, it turns out that uh, the reflectivity of uh, the lunar soil and rocks from ground level was completely different. And also, as we know, uh, we don't have big jagged mountains on the moon as had been portrayed in artists' impressions on the grounds that there was no wind or rain to erode them. But what had not been taken into account was billions of years of micrometeorite impact which had worn them down. So we only have gently rolling hills for the most part. And this picture which because of the position of it um, actually shows the rim of cone crater over there um, and the rest of cone crater that is not the far side of it that is the uh, the vast lunar horizon so the rest of, of the cone crater actually dips down there it was estimated that despite spending a couple of hours searching around uh, for it, um, the astronauts had actually almost reached the, lit, the rim without realizing it because the surface was so undulating. It's such a great pity and it was a disappointment. So in this picture taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, you can see there is the descent module of uh, Apollo 14. You can even see the astronauts tracks because when astronauts move out across the moon, it's not just footprints, but they will kick up dust. And as they disturb the soil, that creates a continuous trail. So this is where the owl set was set up. And uh, here there's trails leading out. They went to this one called Weird Crater, which as you can see is because it is three together. And here you can see the trail going out to Cone Crater. And they did get to Saddle Rock there, but not to the crater itself. You can see how close they came when when um people realized just how close they, they were later on it must have been so much uh, um no exasperation but there, there was one other completely unexpected bonus from apollo 14 when unloading the Olsep station, Ed Mitchell released some ribbons holding the package in place. And here's a video that was broadcast of it. So let me see, over here, there's the MET. You can see there's the wheels and its support. This is Ed Mitchell. Here's the lunar module. There's a leg there. This is one of the probes from underneath the lunar module's foot pad, which is bent upwards on landing. The idea is that when that touches the surface, that's what sets off the contact light inside the cabin. Um, so there's the descent stage engine. And if I start this video, oh no, come on video. Yes. No. Oh. Which is that the video displays, and although it runs, it doesn't actually show it running, which is. Because this show, and I'll try 
once more. If I can do something here which will actually play it. I'm afraid that's upset the sound, Jerry. We can't hear you properly. The sound has gone all wrong. Can you can you go to another slide? I think it's trying to play the sound track to that video. Can you refresh again, Jerry? I'm not surprised they had a problem landing on the moon. We can't get this one to work. this baseball it says Alan Shepard and I did the first Lunar Olympics one golf shot and one javelin throw I won with the javelin <laughs> um, as it turned out both the javelin and a ball landed in a crater uh, I don't know if that counts as uh, a, a bogey for Shepherd or an eagle I'm not sure but anyway um, but the javelin went a bit further so uh, he claims he won the Lunar Olympics the the crater was actually subsequently named javelin crater and there's uh, apparently an image taken from the window of the lunar module which shows the ball and the javelin side by side um, now, what I haven't shown you um, but let me see, if we go back to the the shot of the astronauts, here's the um, the crew and in the background as well as of course on their spacesuits you can see the Apollo 14 
mission patch, which shows a symbol of flight uh, going from the Earth off to the moon. Um, well, this was one of the few missions where the backup crew produced a patch. The backup crew here was uh, um, Gene Cernan, um, Ron Evans, and although he was replaced by uh, Jack Schmidt because they wanted a, a scientist, a geologist on the moon. Originally, it was going to be Joe Engel. And their patch, which I had planned to include in here, uh, looks just like the Apollo 14 patch, except it has the Roadrunner on the moon and the backup crew's names around uh, it with a beep beep. Now, not only did I used to have one of those patches, but I had the follow-up patch, which was incredibly rare. And it, because it was so rare that I couldn't replace it when it got stolen um, at an exhibition that I did once, um, which was the, oh, the, yeah, the, so the symbol of flight uh, was replaced by Wiley Coyote. And on the, the follow-up patch, the coyote has reached the moon and caught the roadrunner, something that he never actually did, of course, in the, the cartoons. And, uh, and around the base, it read, beep, beep, your ass. But there was another Apollo 14 patch. And this one was uh, done as a commemoration patch uh, a couple of years ago. It shows uh, Shepard with his improvised golf club having hit the ball on which it shows the Mercury program symbol. And there's Mitchell with the MET and it says it's been a long way but we're here. Well, the crew uh, completed their work, splashed down in, uh, in the ocean. And this is the Apollo 14 spacecraft on display at the, uh, the uh, Smithsonian adjunct here, uh, in Washington. Uh, if you want to see an Apollo spacecraft, a real Apollo command module, head down to the Science Museum. I used to work there. And uh, it's the only Apollo spacecraft outside the United States. It was loaned to us back in the late 70s. Um, we were given it for a period of three years and <clears throat> it's still there. It was really good because at the time, if anybody said to me, uh, so Jerry, what do you do for a living? I could say, well, I look after Apollo 10, which was really nice. So despite all its, its problems before and during the flight, Apollo 14 turned out as an exceptionally uh, successful mission and uh, contributed enormously to our understanding of the moon. The samples that the crew brought back um, were rather different from those from Apollos 11 and 12. And having done this, it was degree, decreed that um, it was okay to continue with the advanced exploration of the moon, which would take place with what were called the J type missions, Apollo 15, 16 and 17, which uh, put more wheels on the moon. But in this case, they, the astronauts didn't have to pull them, they could ride in them, the lunar rovers. 
um, which greatly enhanced their ability to move around on the surface. Well, we're about to see another craft move around on, the, on uh, a planetary surface um, because on the 18th of February, the Mars 2020 rover Perseverance is due to touch down on Mars. Um, and when it lands, then I'm pleased to say that yet again, I will as well, because my name is on the spacecraft. Not only that, but so is the name of my granddaughter, Phoebe, who I always claim is named after one of the moons of Saturn. Um, she will be 12 in May, uh, very keen on science and space. I wonder where she gets that from. Um, and uh, with Perseverance will be Ingenuity, the name of something amazing. It is a helicopter. Uh, this will hopefully make the very first flight above the surface of another world. That's really quite amazing. Now today I spent a frustrating couple of hours trying to book transport to get me to my COVID-19 vaccination which is taking place tomorrow and I mentioned that because something else that's on Ingenuity is this little plaque um, this commemorates the impact of COVID-19 and pays tribute to the perseverance of healthcare workers around the world. So it shows the symbol of medicine and healing with the above it, there's the craft on its way to Mars. So that's uh, Ingenuity, an artist's impression. And, uh, oh yes, there you go. My flight ticket. And that of Phoebe. Good. Um, we're getting some requests to actually go back to the video again because we didn't hear a word you said because I think the video was trying to play the sound. So um, have you got the, the script you can read out to us? Or I'm, I'm, well, I see in the chat that's... someone has found the actual link to that video. It's all right. Um, I, no, I don't have a script for it. But what I can do, hopefully, is uh, if I get the video up, and um, hang on. Oh, here we go. Now, what I should try to do is share my screen but just show that video um let's see because i don't know with crowdcast as whether i can select which screen i want to share anyway Okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, here we go then. So there's the the pendulum swinging back and forth. Yeah. Right, can you see that? Yes, yeah, so what is the pendulum then? 
So it's just a, a piece of uh, ribbon um, with uh, a clip on the end, which was helping to hold the equipment in place in uh, one of the bays of the descent stage of the lunar module. So having just un unclipped it and let go, and it's swinging back and forth. So as, as I said, this is completely unplanned and so forth. So that's one astronaut there and there's there's the other. So does it go on forever if, if there's no interference or no, um, no atmosphere? Well, as, as you can see, it's actually fixed at the top and as it swings along, it's hitting part of the lunar module there. So there'll be some energy loss and so it will slow down after a while. But um, there's no air resistance. So it would keep on going for ages, but it did get tangled with something, as you can see, just at that point. Right. Yeah, so that wasn't a planned experiment, but it proved something. That's right. Right. Uh, okay, well, we've got quite a few questions coming up. Jerry, do you want to do your... We're, we're on the 8 o'clock mark. Hang on. Oh, Let's yes. uh, see if I can come back to myself. Oh, there we go. Right. Now, do you want right. to um, remind us of the books or should we go into the questions? I think we'll leave the, the question. We'll do the questions now because there are quite a few come in. By all means. Okay, right. Well, the very first one, this will be an interesting one, uh, from Rick Mulhern, a fellow of the Society. He says, Jim McDivitt once told me NASA were goddamn lucky Shepard didn't, didn't kill himself and the crew on Apollo 14. He was alluding in his role as Apollo program manager to Shepard's lack of experience and the poor attitude when it came to training for the mission. Are you aware of anything to support McGillett's claim? No. Okay. So originally, um, Gordon Cooper was assigned to Shepard's crew. Uh, or rather, he was in the running to be assigned. But they didn't assign it because of his poor attitude to training. So there may be a bit of confusion there. He was dropped and he never flew again. Um and as I explained, um, the Apollo 14 crew actually spent longer training than any other Apollo crew to that date. Um, Shepard wouldn't have done anything at all to jeopardize his flight to the moon. So I, mm, no, I don't think so. Mm, the fights between astronauts. Uh, right, well, the next one is um, it's from Les Shoulder, and he's saying, as a follow-on to Rick Mulhern's question, all other previous or later or later moon landings were commanded by multi-mission veterans. Do you think Shepard was given his position as NASA could think of no other way of putting him on a moon landing flight, considering a lack of knowledge of how Shepard would react to space flight, was this a risk they should have taken? Well, it it was a risk. We we would have to ad admit that. But the fact that he was slated for a three day mission, Mercury Ten, um, although it didn't take place, so they certainly had faith in him. Um, I mean, it's just the fact that he was chosen to fly the very first American space flight. Mm. Um, no, it says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. So, no, I, I, I don't really think there's uh, an issue there. Mm. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, now, this one actually again from Les Shoulder. It's, he says, uh, after it had taken six attempts to dock the command module with the lunar module, if on removing the probe from the docking tunnel, it had been seen to have been damaged and the flight abandoned, do you think the remaining Apollo landings could have survived the bad publicity? Um, yeah, it wouldn't have been good to have had two 
not reach the moon in succession. Um, no, it was examined very carefully. They couldn't find anything wrong with it. And it may just be that poor Stu Russo was being too cautious and coming in too slowly and not allowing it to engage. However, having said that, there's a follow-up. Um, four years later, the Apollo-Soyuz test project saw the only other Mercury astronaut to fly in space after Apollo 14, and that was Deke Slayton, who never got to fly on Mercury itself because of his heart problems. He had been working for years and years, going from one doctor and specialist to another, getting signed statements that he was perfectly fit to fly, and eventually NASA said OK. So here was this opportunity on the Apollo side of the Apollo Soyuz test project. And I'm very pleased to see that place at Cape Canaveral in the summer of 1975. Now, as it happens, although it was a new Apollo spacecraft, the command and service modules, they used a docking probe which had been flown on a previous flight, Apollo 14. And guess what? <laughs> they rather had a lot of trouble in docking with the adapter. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but managed to, to do it eventually. So yeah. this, although it, it looked fine and it did eventually operate, there obviously was some kind of, of presumably mechanical problem. Mm. Mm. Right, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, now we've got one here okay. from Fabrizio Bernardini who actually he says he regrets he's going to have to run so he's not um, he's not going to be able to um, respond immediately um, but he hopes we'll give an answer that he can understand right he starts by saying regarding the transposition and docking not sure Rusa could look at the docking target at the same time they were filming it is that correct maybe the clip is from another yeah, no, I did say this is from a window. So the Apollo command module has five windows. So they were looking at it and uh, Rusa's view was directly down line of sight of the target. So this one was very slightly at an angle. It probably doesn't show too much in the video. It may have been uh, the next window to where he was. Mm. Yes, so he, he obviously had a direct view, but the camera yes. probably didn't. Okay. Yes. Yeah, a bit like our Soyuz training module. It's, uh, <laughs> yes. You know, which is more fun. Yes. No, uh, uh, anyone who hasn't tried the, the BIS Soyuz uh, ISS docking um, trainer, then uh, do give it a, a try when, as and when you get the opportunity. Yes, or we'll bring it to you one day when we're allowed back. I'm, yeah. I'm uh, hoping it's easily transportable. Um, right, I've got a, a one that's race to the top here. Sorry. It's actually um, a comment. It doesn't right. actually say who sent it, but can you expand slightly on the geological discoveries made as a result as a result of Apollo 14? Uh, well, basically to say that they picked up various types of breccia on the surface. Um, I did not include um, a lot of detail of that in my presentation on the grounds that uh, it is generally available and um, it's probably better to read it than hear someone tell you. So um, obviously f first step um, there's Wikipedia, of course, but I will strongly recommend everyone to look up the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. This is the world's most detailed site for 
information about Apollo and the landings. You can find the full transcripts of uh, the entire flights. There's all the photos. They have video sequences, uh, analysis, and also for most of the Apollo astronauts, they have transcripts of where they've sat with them going through the videos and information and getting their comments about uh, the flight and what they did um, it's an incredible resource and uh, really deserves all the, the praise it can get the apollo lunar surface journal mm. i thought it's not not one of your books then uh <laughs> no wish it no. wish it was I right i've got another question here from rick Mulhern, who says does jerry have an idea as to how many beat beat patches were carried on board apollo 14. Mm, i don't know the number i know that they did take some of the backup patches with them no um I'm trying to think where you might find that out. Possibly in the Apollo Lunar Service Journal. Yeah, well, I suppose we'll have to look it up one day and see whether it's uh, got any fact or fiction. Um, right, another one here from Alex Wood. Why did MET prove so difficult to use? Well, th they did actually rehearse with it on board one of the... Uh, um, the, the, what they call the zero G training aircraft, although as the title of my forthcoming book um, will point out to everyone, there's no such thing as zero gravity. They, it, even though NASA has it painted in great big letters on the side of the aircraft, um, it, it, we should be referring to it as weightless. Or, mm -hmm case it's it's a low gravity spacecraft because depending on the angle of the parabola can simulate not only weightless but one sixth degree one sixth g sorry uh, and also uh, martian gravity one third and so they did some training with an met inside uh, the aircraft but um no, I think it's just the, the, the fact that A, lunar gravity is not as straightforward and delightful as many people might think. And also because uh, it does bounce quite a bit whenever it hits any kind of uh, obstruction, any rock or something. Uh, funnily enough, even with the lunar rover, which was considerably larger and more massive, uh, there were occasions when the astronauts, rather than drive it and turn it in a different direction, they simply picked it up and turned it round and put it down facing it another way. Mm, it avoids having to do a five point turn. Um, right, well then follow on yeah. to that, quest that one there is actually going to ask the question, it's from Terry Creasy, who says, how heavy was the MET and what did Big Bertha weigh on the moon? Ah, now Big Bertha was one of the, uh, the, well, in fact, I think it was the third largest rock ever brought back. Um, all right, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> uh, because I happens to have... Um, I uh, know oh it, it's in a different section. Apollo 14 National. I, I had a picture of it earlier. Oh. Well, I've got a few more questions. Okay, yeah, yep. Yeah. No, it's all right. I've you got, got it. it coming up. So I can't easily show you the picture, but. Um, lunar sample 14321, would you believe? Let's see what it says about it. Rick, Rick has said 20 kilo, kilograms, I think. 
In fact, Robert Law has already told us that the backup crew put yep. matches in both the CM and, and Lem hidden away to surprise in many lockers, bags, yes. flight manuals. That's right, they did. Um, so the, the Apollo 14 crew didn't uh, take them, but they discovered them during the flight. Well, Rick, Rick has also said that uh, another one was stuck to the with a Velcro patched onto um, Shepard's back. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so Big Bertha weighed, uh, sorry, had a mass of nine kilograms. Nine kilograms? Um, yes. Yes, yes. Oh, is that the so, image for Big Bertha? So six samples were heavier than 50 grams. Grand total of 10 kilo uh, 10 kilograms nine kilograms of which are in one rock sample wow. so apart from that we have less than one kilogram of rock 962 grams <laughs> from what geologist lee silver said was in his opinion the most important single point reached by astronauts on the moon oh well, that's okay, a well, pretty fair testament i see michael garrett has said 20 pounds so rather than 20 kilograms 20 pounds is that equivalent to about 10 kilograms i haven't done this uh, well um two and a quarter pounds of jam weigh about a kilogram i remember yeah. that from my government messages ages ago so yeah well there you yeah. go Okay, right. Um, just see some more questions coming up. And um, why did the MOT, MET prove so difficult to use? That's Alex Ward. We've had that one, haven't we? Yeah, we've um, done that. Yeah. If they had such problems docking in the first place, were, was the, were there no concerns over whether there would be similar problems returning from the lunar surface to the dock in orbit? No, they basically said, right, when you come back again and you go into dock just make sure you don't go in nice and softly just go Round in and in. make sure the thing connects yes we have that problem on the Soyuz docking uh, station I think we'll have to ask Fabrizio oh well that sh sh it shows how accurate it is then. yeah I've bounced out many times um, you have to be exactly the right speed going in so it, it's a learning yes. process for that one um, right, let's go on to the next one then. Uh, how big a risk, this is from Patrick Mann, how big a risk to the mission were the five failed attempts at docking the CM and LM before the sixth attempt worked? What's the worst that could have happened? That they couldn't get a hard dock. And in which case... Uh... What do you do? Do you do an EPA and go in the front hatch of the, the lunar module? No, mission control would not have allowed that. The landing would be off. Mm. And in that case, probably what they would have done was whether they jettisoned the lunar module or not, they would have probably still gone into orbit around the moon and done observations from orbit and maybe even including firing the engine to take it down to just nine miles above the surface so that they could get very close up details. I mean, as it was, whilst um, Edgar Mitchell and Alan Shepard were on the surface for two days, Russo was orbiting the moon and uh, doing a lot of observations, particularly of future plans landing sites so that information would have been very useful still yeah yeah well actually rick's rick's put another couple of things he says it's believed the docking issues were the result of ice on the capture latches after initial docking the probe was cleaned and the moisture dried off nice yeah yeah so um that's the problem yeah. i have that problem with my car can't, can't, can't undo the the driver's door um, right. Uh, so I remember problem with ice in a car. Um, I'm not 
sure i can't tell from here whether my sister josie is watching but uh her first car which was a 21st birthday present from my parents was a a fiat 124 which had a padded roof on the inside except the padding all the way to the edge so there was a padding and a metal in the winter um when it was very cold there would be condensation on the metal which would have frozen and on the way to giving us a lift to school it would melt and drip <laughs> on us and so just like apollo 13 we had rain inside the vehicle mm, memories um, right yes. uh, we've, got, we've got another question actually i ought to read rick rick here said the stone labeled 14321 was placed in the lunar module with approximately 74 pounds of other moon rocks gathered during the mission the astronauts called it big bertha at nearly 20 pounds, it was by far the largest stone collected during the Apollo 14 mission and the third largest ever collected yeah. from the moon. Right, we've got the true facts there. Yeah. Um, right. Oh, I was right, it was the third right. largest. Yeah. Right, I've got a question from Joseph West who says, Hello, sir. What is your favourite orbital rocket and why? Thank you. Favourite orbital rocket? What? As as in a rocket that has put men into orbit? Um, yeah, um, I suppose really. it has to be something that went the complete orbit, yeah. Yeah. Um, really, th th there's no, no consideration on this. It's the Saturn V. Mm. Seven and a half million pounds of thrust, uh, 363 feet tall, if you've ever been to St Paul's Cathedral, not only can you go up into the dome, but you can go up to the top of the dome underneath the cross. The top of that cross is 365 feet above the ground because many cathedrals incorporate numbers to do with the calendar. So they might have 12 huge windows, for example. So 365 feet. The Apollo saturn five was just two feet shorter than that uh, about the size of a naval destroyer so if you can imagine a ship like that turning itself into a vertical position and launching itself up into the sky and you get some idea of the power of the saturn five i thought for a moment you were going to say that the um, bis moonship was your favorite Um, I think there was an implied reel or <laughs> flown. <laughs> yes. In the now, I've got another one from Alex Wood here. Given that Shepard's crew was turned down for 13 due to lack of experience, why were they approved for 14? Um, because by then they would have had enough time to carry out all the training. Yeah. Right? And as it turned out, Apollo 14 was delayed. It was originally meant to go in December 1970. But when the results of the Apollo 13 review came out, there were other modifications that uh, they wanted to make. And so that uh, delayed it for a month. <laughs> right. Actually, John Bontz has put a comment here uh, regarding Apollo Hi, John Bonser, yes. Uh, uh, regarding yeah. Apollo 14 lunar surface activities, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club at St Andrews wrote to Alan Shepard yes. to politely point out that he had not replaced the divot created on the lunar <laughs> by his golf shot. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that happened yes. on my golf course, which was on uh, in in Dollar, fairly near you, John. Uh, right. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and also, I, I, speaking of golf, I suppose I can mention, that, I mean, as the Royal St Andrews is in Scotland, there is, well, there are lots of golf courses in Scotland, one of them owned by a certain American. Yeah, big man. And uh, 
back in November, the local paper um, had a headline about that, which said uh, local golf course owner loses election <laughs> <laughs> without mentioning any names. Yes. OK. Right. We've got another question from Robert Law here. Was the docking probe on Apollo 14 CM reused on Apollo 16 and again gave problems? I don't think it was used on 16. As I said, it was used on Apollo Soyuz. Right. I may be wrong. I haven't uh, looked that up. OK, good. Let's move on. We're, we're not really running out of time. Um, right. Just answer my question. Got it wrong. Not 16. This is Robert saying, oh, yes. OK. ASTP was the he's saying it wasn't wasn't 16. It was ASTP. There we go. Yeah, that's the answer. Uh, right. Uh, oh, now we've got. Sorry, one I'm here. looking around. For something well, uh, which I had here earlier. Hey. All right, let's carry on. OK, well, Rick, Rick's come up with another question here. He's saying the largest sample brought back from Apollo 14 called Big Bertha included a piece of rock originating from Earth, embedded within the first such find, and I think perhaps the only such find on all the landings. Hmm, didn't know that. That is interesting, and uh, I don't recall having heard of that before. Yeah, we'll we have to know. know. We'll have to get yeah, the, Rick to tell us all about his rocks. Yes. Right. Um, I've got another one here. Just trying to work out who it's from. It's another one from Mr. Comment. Um, what were the modifications to Apollo 14? Uh, what modifications were made to Apollo 14 as a result of Apollo 13? Okay. Well, uh, there's a whole page uh, about this, which I was wondering about putting in. Um, uh, basically, they added a, a third oxygen tank sighted on the opposite side of the service module. So if anything happened, they'd still have that. That was the, the major thing. Um, also, various things that would act as precautions against being able to run the heaters on 68 volts, which is what happened during the ground test when they're designed to be run from 12 volts. And that's why the insulation was burnt off mm. during the test. Mm. And that, that was really the, the big problem because it was run from the wrong voltage on the ground. Um, right. So they, they did things to stop that being able to happen again. Um, there were some other physical changes, um, I think, to, to do with the fuel cells uh, as well. Okay, right. Um, ah, now, here's a plug for you. Keith T is saying, how much is your child's signed book? Ta -da! Okay. So, cover price is five ninety nine six pounds um so for um eight pound fifty that covers postage and packing okay so all you need to do is send me an email jerry dot stone 2001 at gmail.com and uh we'll see about uh ways to pay and uh, I'll get your address and get it sent off to you and you also right. you need to tell me who it's going to be signed to whether it's yourself or someone else okay you email email to Jerry yes um right here's one that actually I've, I've got um Robert Law and Rick Mal Malheim Malhern again um Check out Apollo 14 Remastered on YouTube and you'll see details of Big Bertha. Well, that's useful. And Robert Law says, yes, the American Space Museum Stay Curious program last week talked about the Earth meteorite returned by Apollo 14. 
So more details there. Right. That's interesting uh, because, uh, I mean, we have various meteorites on Earth that have come from the moon, mm. uh, tektites produced by impacts on the moon, throwing material out, and in the low gravity and absence of an atmosphere to slow it down, they go, can reach lunar escape velocity. Mm. And so they can drift to Earth. But for the reverse to happen, uh, that takes a lot more energy, of course. And um, that's why they're so in incredibly rare. Plus, the moon, something from the moon hitting the Earth, which has uh, two, three, four times the diameter of the moon um, and six times the gravity, that's more likely to happen than something from Earth hitting the moon, isn't it? Mm. 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 Right. OK, well, let's let's go on a little bit. We've got two more questions here. Uh, this one from Simon Ould says, not directly Apollo related, but how do you rate the chances of Artemis three landing on the moon in 2024? Um, can I take that in two parts? <laughs> First part, chances of Artemis three landing on the moon. Yes. Yes, I think on the whole, it probably will in 2024 uh, now now <laughs> i'm not sure i mean it depends on every part working according to this is why never um nasa never said um early on apollo 11 will be our first lunar landing they didn't know mm it needed everything to work in sequence and along that sequence things got changed for example apollo 8 was meant to be the first test flight of a lunar module but it wasn't ready so now there are various stories to, about this um, the one that i used to tell was that um, Deke Slayton went to the commander of Apollo 8 and said, um, OK, we had this plan that how about taking Apollo 8 around the moon? And the commander of Apollo 8, that is Jim McDivitt, said no. He said that his crew has trained and trained and trained for a lunar module mission. And if a lunar module wasn't ready, he'd waste and signals. So Deke went to the commander of Apollo 9 and Frank Borman said yes. And so they swapped crews. Um, mm -hmm. Now there's another way, uh, uh, another statement, which says that Deke Slayton knew that Jim McDivitt would turn that down. And so he never bothered to ask him. He just went straight to the commander of Apollo 9 and asked Frank Borman, would you like your crew to fly to the moon? And he said yes. But regardless, the two swapped crews. And when they did that, they took their backup crews with them. So the backup crew to Apollo 9 now begins back to Apollo 8. You're breaking and up, John. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Mike Collins were now prime crew for Apollo 11. Otherwise, they would have been prime crew for Apollo 12, and Pete Conrad would have been the first man to step onto the moon instead, instead of the Ooh. third. So things change. So we, despite the problems with the engine test for SLS recently, it, they've said that uh, they're happy that they got the data that they needed. Um, it would not surprise me, though, if they do repeat that test in order to get a full duration test, the full, uh, was it, eight minutes that, that they need. So if they do that, that may delay the 
Artemis One flight, which is due currently in November, and that may slip, and that may slip the date of the first crew flight, etc., etc. Mm. 2024, I would say it could be done. It's a bit ambitious. It all depends on who's president but, at the time. Well, no, 2024, it'll still be Biden as president. Yeah. Um, we, we've yet to see, uh, I think, about who's going to be the new NASA administrator um, and his views. But um, the other thing is, of course, whether some Musk guy might slip in with a starship and land before then. No, I don't think that will happen either. I mean, mm. his rate, uh, the rate of development from SpaceX has been absolutely incredible and they are to be yep. hugely congratulated for that. But mm. uh, landing something the size of Starship on the moon and then getting it off again, or at least parts of it, that is yep. a massive challenge. That really, really is. Of course, we want to see it happen. Right. OK, now I've got one more question here, and there's quite an interesting chat going on about the Apollo 8-9 swap. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, we maybe Simon hasn't, uh, Simon Old hasn't, uh, I think a minute ago, um, he didn't know about oh, Apollo 8-9 yes. swap. If it hadn't happened, would it have resulted in Pete Conrad being the first human on the moon? Very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, they repeated. Yes. OK. Now we've got one. Last uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. I can see the, the other comments about Artemis that the uh, the engine test is being repeated. Yeah. And uh, if it does delay Artemis one, that won't affect Artemis two. No. Which is sort of what you'd expect. Yeah. Because yeah. they it, there is such a huge gap between the flights. Yeah. And they do all the modifications onto the second flight anyhow, so they'll be keeping up with them. Yeah. Um, right, let's get on with this one here. We've got one from Terry Bennett here, who says, um, uh, he says, thank you, Jerry, for an interesting presentation. Will you be doing another one to celebrate Apollo 15 in July? Oh, yes. Yes, so I'm, I'm doing one for uh, uh, every Apollo flight. Now, so, if, I, uh, if, I can uh, add, if I can add in here, we're hoping to have a special guest, um, a relative of one of the uh, uh, one of the, the crew members. Ah, okay, because the BIS has a long-standing relationship um, engagement with with uh, Al Warden, who sadly passed away last year. Um, in fact, something I, that I should add is that uh, all three of the Apollo 14 astronauts are no longer with us. And that was the first mission on which we lost the entire crew. Mm. Uh, fortunately, Dave Scott is still alive. And uh, so we look forward to him being able to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his lunar flight yeah um it's such a shame that we've lost john young from apollo 16 and gene cern and apollo 17. Mm. 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 right okay well let's look look forward to the uh july talk then um i've got here one last question uh quasi apollo related which beer are you drinking <laughs> I see that's me. I'm sorry. I shouldn't advertise, but it's re related to a, a chicken. Um, right. I think that's it, Jerry. I can see they've got all the comments have been completed. We still have 169 people uh, looking in. So um, they were obviously impressed by what, what you had to say. I think that's no new questions now. So I'm going to have to wrap up. If I can just find my own notes, I think they're somewhere here on the screen. Um, okay, now I, I'm just going to stand up while I look for something which I'd hoped to show earlier, and I had it, and I can't. 
Really we've seen, we've seen your book, but now you're off the screen, Jerry. Discipline. Oh. Can we, right. can we put him back on the screen? He's got something to show us. Yes. I'm, I'm back. And I have Here we you. are. You're back. Right. This is a birthday present from my sister, Josie, who I mentioned earlier. Oh, um, yeah. She, she's printed this and... It has, oh, this is re reverse, but it has my name on the back. Everybody personalized BIS t shirt. Thank well, you, Josie. You the right way round from here, Jerry. Well done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, right, um, well, I... my, my birthday's um, on the 7th, and I've got notification from Hearts County Council that I will get my bus to pass. Oh, good. <laughs> Some of us have had it for years. Um, right, well, thank you very much, Jerry, for a, a fascinating talk and the detailed answers to some of the questions, I think. Um, and we've got some support from our local uh, uh, support uh, group here who've got some of the answers as well. Um, but really, thank also to Elizabeth for coordinating the event behind the scenes. I think it all worked in yes. the end. Uh, now, our next talk is on 18th of February by Dr. Paolo Ferri. Until recently, he was head of operations at ESA. Uh, he'll be telling us all about ESA flight operations, and we hope to follow that with a live link to the Perseverance landing on Mars at about 2030 to 2040 GMT. So that should be just after we've finished our Q&A. We're hoping to have a, a live Zoom link to the actual NASA website. Uh, now, thanks to Fabrizio, we have two more talks lined up for the 2nd and the 17th of March. The details should already be on the website and in the next issue of Spaceflight. The two important events that we've got to announce are the 12th of April, the Beyond the Moon Symposium. The call for papers is out still, and we're still looking for ideas on where we should go uh, in the future within the solar system probably, uh, starting from the moon and where we might go from there. And also we want to look at the 10 barriers highlighted in Jerry Webb's recent article in Spaceflight, radiation, extended flight time, lack of gravity, self-supporting habitats, infection, very uh, true to the topic that one, mental survival and reliance on machine intelligence and economic, socio-cultural and political religious effects. So there's a lot to be held in that one there, and we're hoping to get about 10 or 15 papers through in the day. Now on the 28th to 30th of June, the Reinventing Space Conference is still on at the QE2 Conference Center. We hope that we can do it face to face, and we're look looking for papers on, I think we've got about 40 so far, but we could do with a, a few more. And we're looking at the environmental and sustainability considerations in relation to space, including protection in our, protecting our environment and space debris, and the space support for economic recovery in post-COVID-19 era. So there's a lot to be thought about there. And I'm hoping to get some papers in from the medical fraternity, Aerospace Medicine, because they really do know what we're going to have to put up with on our long distance flying. Now, on finally, um, we've extended the deadline on the both the uh, symposium, the Reinventing Space Conference, and also on the Arthurs. So if you've got any one you think deserves a, an Arthur, we've kept the books open now till the 15th of February, and details for those are on bis-space.com stroke Arthurs. And so you should be able to make any... any uh, uh, nominations in there. So we hope to see you all at the Reinventing Space Conference dinner when we'll be presenting these awards in the Conference Centre at Westminster on the 29th of June. So hope to see you all there. And thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Elizabeth. I think it's about time we signed off. Thanks a lot. All the best. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.